Hello everyone, Yesh here, and today we're going to be talking about Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, probably one of the weirdest films in the MCU. Well, not really funny. it was weird at the time. I mean, the biggest thing with this movie is that it was the first film in the entire MCU to get really weird. I mean, to really explore the universe and go beyond Earth and really go and see what you can do with space, where you can explore in space. And sure, we had Thor, and Thor was pretty uh, good with sort of expanding the world building and going beyond Earth and seeing what else is out there. And of course, we had Avengers with the aliens and then the teaser for Thanos at the end. So we had some moments, but this was the first movie to really embrace how weird and out there we can and how how much of a risk Marvel is willing to take. I mean, in hindsight, this is... This is the... I mean, the reason why I would say it's the weirdest movie is because I don't think anything like this has ever been done before. I mean, you have a character who says, I am Groot, over and over again, as his main dialogue. That's his way of speaking. You have a talking raccoon. You have an alien woman. You have Drax the Destroyer. And then you have our, our, our main lead, Peter Quill, a.k.a. Star-Lord. This is the weirdest group of characters I've ever seen. And, you know, it's interesting. This movie came out in 2014. So it came out the same summer that Captain America the Winter Soldier did. And it's incredible how Marvel released two films that are so polar opposites of each other. I mean, Captain America Winter Soldier was this grounded, realistic, political thriller action film that was meant to be relatable, meant to hit some, uh, really go to some really emotional places in a very grounded way. And Guardians of the Galaxy was the complete 180 of just being a weird, crazy, fun space opera. Like, I mean, the best way to describe it is like Adult Swim's take on Star Wars. It's like Adult Swim saying, hey, we're going to take the idea of Star Wars and we're going to be really, take it, have a lot of fun with it, parody it a little bit, really embrace the weirdness and go all out. And honestly, the movie delivers. And it's, but more, it's something that I've been wondering is why? This is such a weird film. I've never heard of this. I don't think anyone's ever heard of this. And yet it became such a big hit when it came out. Everybody loved it. How did this movie, which is so weird and strange, so random, so had no fan base, or not strong enough of a fan base beforehand, and yet it became profitable, yet these characters are household names and people know them. And But there are a few key points as to why I believe that's the case. First key point is the director, James Gunn. He is a phenomenal director. I mean, if you know him, you know he directed Slither and Super and all these other um, short, I mean, it was these lower budget indie films, but these indie, these indie films know how to balance that dark humor. They can be kind of dark, but they know how to balance, he knows how to balance the comedy in these dark situations very well in his movies. And you see him do that with um, Guardians of the Galaxy. I mean, the movie has a lot of dark, moments in it for a a family film i mean the movie opens with the main character peter quill as a kid and he's in a hospital and he sees his mom die of cancer right in front of him it's such a and there's and it just plays it like a straight emotional dramatic scene it's so intense it's it's very hard and then it cuts to transitions into the kid getting abducted by an alien spaceship. And then you see the Marvel logo. That is, that has to be the most quickest tonal change I have ever seen. It went from him going through an emotional trauma of seeing his own mom die of cancer in front of him in a hospital bed to getting abducted by aliens. And then cut to a Marvel logo. And it's so... But I think what makes this film work, even though it is so weirdly tonal, is that James Gunn is a very good writer and he knows how to write characters in such a realistic, relatable, personal way to where it works. 
And this movie keeps surprising you. I mean, as the story continues, you see Star Lord, and he's and they show at, at in the beginning of the movie they show him going to this planet because he's gonna get the uh, power stone, with, and uh, you know at first they show in a very dark, serious, dramatic way. Like this is a film you take seriously. You see him just wear the mask. You don't even see the Star Lord mask. You don't see him with his face or anything. And he's walking on this dark, desolate planet, and you go into these ancient ruins, and then. <laughs> It immediately changes tonally to him just removing the mask off, just checking if there's anyone there, putting the headphones on, and then come and get your love by Redbone Place. And then the title the the title of the film just pops up. Just in a comedic fashion, while you see Star Lord just dancing to that song and just having a good time. And it's it's, it's a weird tonal shit, but it's so unexpected, it's funny. And it works because it's, it is something that you don't expect. It's, it's like this movie knows how to play with your expectations. Like you walk in, you have expectations for like, oh, this is what a normal general movie would do. And then this movie takes it in a very unique, creative, and different direction. And I applaud this movie for doing that. I applaud James Gunn for doing that. He's a great writer. You can tell with his comedy that he's... His comedy is very unique and different. It doesn't try to copy other people's comedy. It doesn't even try to be obvious comedy, which can be funny, but you've seen it done a thousand times in different films. The comedy in this film is unique because it, it's totally... <clears throat> it's situational comedy. It's based on the comedy of the characters versus like comedy that's just meant to, oh, well, let's throw a funny scene in there because... That's a funny joke a lot of people like. It's comedy that's a result of the circumstances that drives the story forward. I mean, there's a great scene at the end of the movie. Well, not the end, but near the third act, like right before the final act, where you see our main hero just standing around in a circle. And they talk about it. And Rocket Raccoon just goes, and by the way, Rocket Raccoon's the best character. One of the best characters in this movie. There's so many, but like he's my favorite. He's awesome. And you see this Rocket Raccoon just goes, Oh, well, how much of a plan do you have? And Star-Lord like, I, I don't know, 12%. They're like, 12%? Do you call that a plan? And, it's, and that's just one example I can come up with right now. But it's little things like that that just feels different. Even some of the best lines is like Rocket Raccoon's ass. It's like, that's your plan? We're going to rob the guys who beat us senseless? Do you call that figured it out? And it's just... Funny. Like, like, even, like, another moment is when they're in prison. They're, like, in a space prison, and they gotta escape, figure a way out. And then Rock explains to them, oh, I've gotten out of prison. I've gotten out of 22 prisons. This won't be any different. And then he explains to them, like, okay, I need you to get this. I need you to get that. And then uh, Peter Quill, or a.k.a. Star-Lord's response is, well, how are we gonna get that? That's so hard. And then Rock and Raccoon's response is, I got one planet and it requires a freaking Cornex battery, so figure it out. And then in the background, you just see some guy get hit by uh, some falling de falling debris, and it and you know, it's just so situational. It works. Even the scene is <laughs> so. Another great scene is when Star Lord needs to get a leg as part of Rocket Raccoon's plan. He needs to get a mechanical leg from another one of the inmates because Rocket Raccoon needs it to escape the prison. So there's a great cut scene where you have one moment where Rocket Raccoon finds Drax throws him the gun. And, and Drax, oh my god, that guy's great in this movie. But Drax throws him the gun. And then Rocket's like, oh, yeah. And then he just fires everyone, all these other like uh, prison robots that are attacking them. And he's just, he's just yelling and he's so happy that he gets to have this blaster and he's just taking them all out. And then it just cuts to a quiet moment where the prison with the mechanical leg just looks at uh, Peter Quill and just goes, you need my what? And it's so creative like that. It's so creative because it's, it's genuine. And that's another thing I feel like another key point about this film that works is that it feels genuine. I mean, you know, the opening scene with that, I was showing 
how Peter Quill as a kid has to see his mom die of cancer in front of him. And you feel it. I mean, the kid, the act, the kid actor is really good, but you see the, the yelling and the screaming and then and, and that, that, that feeling of hopelessness that his mom just died in front of him. But he knew how to handle that so maturely. And then as the movie progresses, you see more about that relationship with his mother. You see how the music in the film doesn't feel cheap. It doesn't feel like we're just blasting a pop song, you know, because it's popular. That's what the kids, you know, that, 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 that'll make our movie a lot more money because we have so-and-so pop songs. You see that these the, the, the songs are what connect him to his mother. So you add, you have it, the movie knows how to add that emotional element. So when you're playing like Hooked on a Feeling or uh, if you like Pina Colada or any of the classics, it it's it's not just you're hearing a good song. You you feel that these these songs help him connect with his past, help him connect with his mother. And then even when the movie ends, I mean, spoiler alert, this movie's been out for five years. Watch it if you haven't seen it. But spoiler alert, you see how there was one gift that Peter's mom gave him at the beginning of the movie that he didn't open and be, and he didn't want to open yet because it's the last thing his mom ever gave him before she died and he didn't want to he wasn't ready to open it but then at the end of the movie after go overcoming their personal demons and after finding his new family with the other guardians of the galaxy he finally gets he finally opens that box and reads the letter that his mom gave him and you feel it you feel the that emotional you feel that sense of closure that he finally got with his mother. That he that he's able to accept his mom's death and able to move on with his life. And then he gets a second uh, second mixtape with all those songs. And then they play Ain't No Mountain High Enough. And it's such a beautiful way to end this movie. And and then and then after that it's Want You Back by Jackson Five. And it's just just beautiful the way these these songs don't feel like um like a marketing team came up with them and said add these into the movie they feel like they're the perfect song specific perfect songs picked out by james gunn that are meant to serve the story and that's the beauty of this of this film is that it knows how to tell a story it's not here to just hey we have action special effects we're here to tell you a story that that's relatable and engaging and funny and our characters are misfits i mean the guardians of the galaxy did they're, they're, they're losers i mean they say it in the movie like again that's the unexpected thing you know we're so used to seeing like oh they're the heroes they're the good guys but in this movie they're the losers they even admit it that they're losers they're losers or they're thieves or they're just people who kill someone after meeting them for five minutes and and again all these are just lines from the movie like my description of them is literally lines in the movie and they'll they'll say it in the movie that they're losers and but it works and it's funny and and it's i mean i just think about that one moment when gamora she is usually the strong independent uh, character and so <laughs> she when other the other character doing something stupid her response is i'm gonna die surrounded by the biggest idiots in the galaxy and it works and it's amazing and i'll give you this i feel like once again the story is pretty generic you have your generic bad guy ronin played by lee pace who's a great character actor and it's a shame that he's covered in all that makeup because i feel like he probably would have been more popular if you could actually see his face but because it's all the makeup and design but you know that's part of acting and but it's a great design it's very creative and interesting and i love how the joke is that the main characters our lead main characters are playing you know they're the creative funny underdog they're like the thieves they're like the scoundrels and it works but our villain is straight up serious deadpan no emotion but it works. That dichotomy works beautifully because, I mean, the best example is the ending of the movie. I mean, sure, we have our final 
third act with the battle sequence and, and with the, with the ships with the spaceships fighting each other and the battle sequence but it's more than that the third act is actually unique because they do something very different with it i mean all the spoiler it ends with him trying to trick the villain uh, peter quill tries to trick the villain by doing a dance off and then he's just dancing and then ronan's like what what are you doing and then he's like dance off bro it's me and you and it's it's so unexpected and funny and it works because he was trying to distract him so that rocket can build the cannon to uh, take him out to get the power stone and and then there's a beautiful scene with the power stone where it can where all of the guardians stand next to each other and they hold on to that stone and you see that they're a team and you see the score played by tyler created by tyler bates which is a great score all these marvel films have great scores and it works but and this movie also has a great score by tyler bates and you feel that you feel that this that they've all they hated each other they didn't know each other well enough but then at the end of the movie they're a family and you feel that you you see that how that progression from them being isolated and lonely because the, the family they had was gone or they never had anyone or they were just with the wrong people and it's you see or they were just in abusive relationships and you see how they come together through that suffering and that's what makes this beautiful this movie beautiful is that it's a, it's like a it's like a team movie with such creative interesting characters that's funny it's got that adult swim kind of humor to it that works beautifully and and, and, it, and it works and i think i mean that's the main reason i feel like any and that's the reason why i feel marvel is so successful is that they're willing to let a director just do his own thing this movie feels like James Gunn had an idea for a story and Marvel said, go do your film. We're not going to... In Marvel, I mean, they're creating a whole universe. They're, they're trying to create films that tie together. And here's a film where Marvel's like, just go ahead, do your thing. Be creative, be weird, be funny. Have fun with it. Marvel gave James Gunn so much creative freedom to let him just go for it and have a good time. And James Gunn delivered, and it's great. And it's, and it's great that we finally get a film that really explores the cosmic part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And it does it in such a good way. And that's the beauty of this film, is that it is a fun film, for sure. It has funny moments. It's, it's a beautiful CGI. That is creative. It's unique. It's different. It's weird. But it's also heartfelt and emotional. It deals with a lot of tough stuff, like... Like, not just Peter Quill's mom dying of cancer, but also Gamora and Nebula's abusive relationships they've had with their father, Thanos. And, and, and just, you get, the, you get a hint of that. It's not a lot, but you see it. You feel through Gamora. Gamora, you know, Zoe Saldana is a great actress. So she has to act a, and really just, she, you know, we don't actually see a lot of stuff from her past. So we have to believe in her, just through her acting, just through her emotional presence, what kind of abusive, abusive of a life she's had after what Thanos did to her family and did to her, her entire life, to turn her into this weapon. And yeah, this movie's amazing. I highly recommend it. I think this movie deserves to get all the fame and acclaim and, and the critic success financial success because it truly is a film that deviated from it's the kind of film that i don't think other any other hollywood studio would be comfortable with making i mean so many i mean also you have to at the time marvel movies were i mean movies in general were trying to be like the dark knight you know like superhero comic book films had to be like the dark knight gritty dark series and this was the first film in a while to say nah comic book movies can be fun they can be wacky they can be weird you know but before there was this idea that if you make it fun and weird then you're gonna lose the respect for the genre and people won't take it seriously but this movie had the opposite effect where it was fun and wacky and embraced what it was embraced the weirdness 
and people respected it for it because the movie still had heartfelt moments. The movie had some deep, troubling moments. But because you care about these characters and these characters progress throughout the film to become better people, better heroes, you feel for them and you relate with them. And then you have a movie that beautifully balances the comedy and the, the, the harsh dramatic moments of life. And so I highly recommend this film and I think everyone should check it out. And if you're not a comic book fan, you might enjoy, or a superhero person, you might enjoy this film if you're just into space operas. If you're just into a Adult Swim kind of humor, and uh, it's like Adult Swim's take on Star Wars in a wacky, weird way, this is the perfect film for that, honestly. So yeah, definitely check it out.